I'm going to be honest, y'all. Like, I didn't want to do this. <laughs> I didn't want to do this subject. Uh, I've been asked about it for a really long time. But I didn't want to do it because this was honestly something I was never actually into um, in the new age. Like, for the buffet of new age and self-help that I was constantly feeding from, the Enneagram was actually surprisingly never on my plate. However, the demand for this has been really high for quite some time, especially as my following grows. This is one thing that I get asked about. I would say it's like in my top three that I get asked about most. And I did a poll on my Instagram earlier this week asking y'all what you wanted to see on the live stream next. And the response was overwhelmingly on the subject. And again, I really didn't want to do this. Um, because I really knew nothing about it. And I knew it was going to be a lot of work. So lo and behold, seven hours later of literally research and putting this together all day, here it is. And look, I tried hard to actually prepare something else for tonight, um, but the Lord wouldn't let me. I mean, that literally, like, I, the Holy Spirit ministered clearly to me that this needed to be talked about because it grieves him that this stupid test has infiltrated the church and deceived not only the secular world, but actually the body of Christ. Um, and we know Hosea 4, 6 says that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Uh, so I know this is a topic the Lord wants to educate y'all on tonight because after this stream, you will no longer be able to carry on in ignorance of the subject. <laughs> Okay, if you, if, you're, if you already have thus far, right? If you know nothing about it, something you're using, you think it's harmless, you're a Christian, right? So now after this, if you choose to continue using the Enneagram or if you choose to not speak up to your church on this after we have the discussion, you will be doing so in willing full disobedience. Um, so I just want to put that out there because I really pray that we have some repentance and softened hearts in the chat tonight that are ready to surrender their entirety to God. Um, and I do mean my brothers and sisters in the faith. If anyone that's just in the occult is curious and wants to watch this, then I pray that you just give your faith to Christ tonight. All in all, sanctification can be a process from there. But this really is for my church family, because like I said, this is something I get a lot is that, Angela, this is in my church. Angela, this is, why are my pastors teaching the Enneagram? Why are they teaching this in youth group? Um, so that being said, we're going to kind of get into four different tiers of the subject tonight. One, I'm going to cover what is the Enneagram. I already, uh, see, I already see some people asking in the chat. So that's really good that you're here to learn about it. And then two would be the history and the origins of the Enneagram, which surprise, uh, demonic, much like everything else in the world. And you know, to that, I want to say something because it's going to be in the comments. It always is. Not everything is demonic. Okay, anything that is not of Christ is anti-Christ. So you tell me a better word to use than demonic. Just saying. Three, how did it infiltrate the Christian church and why is it so popular? And four, identity in Christ. That's the part I'm looking forward to most of this entire thing because we all know the Enneagram is about identity, correct? So y'all, I have to say, it took me like all but 30 seconds of researching this topic to see that it's of the occult. Like literally 30 seconds. The first time I sat down to start looking into it earlier this week when I saw y'all were voting on it, 30 seconds, I knew it was of the occult. I just don't know why your local pastor can't do that before he teaches it to his congregation. I don't know. I digress. Um, again, please subscribe, like the video, and if you would consider a monthly partnership with Heaven and Healing, we're entirely crowdfunded. I could not do this without your support and the generosity that God kind of puts on your heart to sow into the ministry. I do have a pinned link to support Heaven and Healing up in the chat. There's also other ways to do so that's going to be in the episode description as well. So please consider that. Um, seven hours of work to put this together for you all today. Just saying. Uh, at the end of the conversation, we'll pray and hang out in the chat together. So definitely please stick around for that.
So let's get into it, y'all. If you haven't liked the video, do it already. The amount of likes does not match the concurrent viewers. So let's change that. What is the Enneagram? Okay, now bear with me because I have some fun illustrations. See that? Isn't that fun? All right. What is the Enneagram? So on the surface of the research, as you begin looking into the Enneagram, it all seems quite innocuous and even beneficial, right? Because it presents as means to overall understand yourself better and thus become better. The proverbial self-help journey. The intents and purposes of it is, again, on the surface, all about self-awareness and self-discovery. So this definition is actually from WebMD. I wanted to get kind of like a descriptor on what exactly the Enneagram is in layman's terms, because the more I dug into it, um, the more I realized how seriously layered, thorough, and in-depth it is. Honestly, like, it's so extra, y'all. I'm not going to lie. Um, I can see why this is a rabbit hole that people just kind of plunge into head first. I saw the word any, uh any obsession, any obsession when I was doing my research. So people get any obsessed with the Enneagram. I love a good pun. Um, so the more I dug into it, the more I realized how layered it is. I can see why it's a rabbit hole that people just go right into and can never escape from. It's one of those narcissistic self-help spiritual narcotics that becomes a cult-like obsession that people completely lose themselves in and use as like the barometer of everything they do and identify within. Kind of reminds me of astrology. Thought this was really, um, thought this was really appropriate to do after the astrology, um, after the astrology episode last week. Sorry that I kind of lagged there. Someone said that y'all see in ads. I don't know why you're seeing ads. You shouldn't be. I don't know how to, I don't know how to turn that off. That's, really annoying uh, delay ads i i hit delay ads i don't know why ads are showing up during the live someone said they keep getting ads that is so annoying the devil is such a liar he hates this he hates this conversation today i've never i, I never even heard of ads on a live i've never seen that before okay well y'all shouldn't get any now I just hit a button that says delay, which I've also never seen that before. Anyway, I'm sorry. I just, that distracted me in the chat. I just want you all to like enjoy the stream. So, okay. Anyway. Um, where was I? So this is according to WebMD, what the Enneagram is defined as. Ac this is from WebMD. This is what it says. It says, according to the Enneagram theory, each person develops one of nine, so we can see that on the screen, right? One of nine predominant personality strategies or types by adulthood, which helps them cope with the external environments. The corresponding fears and desires related to each type are examined to understand the underlying motivations behind someone's behavior. So here are the nine Enneagram personality types, and they all have their own descriptions, which I'm not going to read because it's really not important. But here are the nine just for the sake of knowing. The perfectionist, the helper, the achiever, the individualist, the investigator, the loyalist, the enthusi enthusiast, enthusiastist. I, I'm sorry, I'm very bad at pronunciation. The challenger and the peacemaker. And now this, this, okay, is from the Enneagram Institution, Institute itself, the actual website, Enneagram Institute, which is, again, why I'm saying I don't know why pastors can't just look this up, but there's a lot of stuff um, surrounding the info of this that's based from the Enneagram Institute. I thought, where better place to get it from, right? So, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm new to all the streaming stuff. I hope those lines aren't there. Okay, so the Enneagram is a three-by-three three arrangement of nine personality types. 
in three centers, as you can see on the screen, right? Um, there are three types in the instinctive center, three in the feeling center, and three in the thinking center. As shown here, each center consists of three personality types that have in common the assets and liabilities of that center. For example, personality type four has unique strengths and liabilities involving its feelings, which is why it's in the feeling center. Likewise, the eights assess ass assets and liabilities involve its relationship to its instinctual drives, which is why it is in the instinctive center and so forth for all personality types. And for those of you that are watching on the replay right now or listening rather, it may be honestly better for you to come back during a time where you can watch it on YouTube because I'm putting images on the screen for the sake of visualizations. Okay. Um, so the inclusion of, again, this is continued from the Enneagram Institute. The inclusion of each type in its center is not arbitrary. Each type results from a particular relationship with a cluster of issues that characterize that center. Most simply, these issues revolve around a powerful, largely unconscious emotional response to the loss of contact with the core of the self. Loss of contact with the core of the self. Hmm. In the instinctive center, the emotion is anger or rage. In the feeling center, the emotion is shame. And in the thinking center, it is fear. Of course, all the nine types contain all three of these emotions, but in each center, the personalities of the types are particularly affected by that center's emotional theme. All right, so we see how that went from the surface level layman terms that I was going for to complicated very quickly. Um, I'm not going to go deeper than that because like I said, it's not important. I don't really want to teach y'all on it. This isn't like a teaching on how to know the Enneagram. And I don't want to like bring more attention to the identity crisis that this so clearly perpetuates, um, or risk you, you being turned on to it or being curious, honestly, because the point of the stream isn't to show you what it can do for you on your self discovery journey. The point is to elaborate on why the Enneagram should be forsaken altogether by diving into its origins roots, ties to the occult, and most importantly, to set your sights back on Christ, encouraging you to be who he says you should be. That is the key here, okay? I just want to provide as much as I did for the sake of having you having rather a very basic understanding of what it is and um, to see, as I mentioned, how it took us quite literally no time at all to see how this, how very deep this thing gets, the more you learn about it. So you can just see right away that rabbit hole, right? It just, it, it's right there. The second someone gets into this thing, straight down, straight down. So I've heard from a lot of followers that this is like the Christian Zodiac. And I totally see what y'all mean by that. Um, because there are just layers and layers and layers to this Enneagram thing that's like an infinite array of ways to eat the forbidden fruit of hidden knowledge, right? From the tree of good and evil, uh, which is, of course, all manipulated to self-empower, to flatter the self, to understand the self, and biggest red flag of all, to save the self, right? That's the thing with the Enneagram and any type of personality test, really. It's all about a self-savior complex. Now, people are going to ask me, okay, so are all personality tests bad? I have a question for you. How do you, how do you reconcile the verse, all things are permissible but not beneficial? How do you reconcile a personality test to dying to self? We'll get more on that later, but I just want to kind of lay the groundwork for that now, you know, because that's what this is all about, right? This, this, this Gnostic self-discovery, the Enneagram, any personality test, really. Oh, if I just set out on a mission of personal self-discovery to obtain ultimate self-awareness, I can unravel all the mysteries of my self-shortcomings so that I can thus tap into my self-sufficiency in order to grow thyself with the ultimate goal of self-service. Because, let's be honest, that's all this Enneagram stuff is. It's self-service. It's self-saving. It's self-obsessing. 
It is narcissism. But of course, within the, prog the progressive Christian worldview, this has all been pervertedly contorted as means of, oh, this is just how you can better understand of how God designed you. No, sweetie, that's serpent in the garden talk. And I know that game all too well because I did it with astrology. This is just the blueprint of how God designed you. That's exactly what I used to say when I had the convoluted, deceptive belief that I could be a Christian astrologer, that I could just use astrology as the blueprint of how, how God created me and what he wants for my life. And that's what people are doing with the Enneagram, right? Oh, this is how God designed me. Now I can understand that better. No, 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 honey. <laughs> the Enneagram isn't about God's uh, God's will for your personality at all. It's not about the discovery of God's will for your personality or or your life or the trajectory of your relationships. That's just something I guess churches will say to sugarcoat what it actually is. So what the Enneagram actually is, is it's an attempt to play God yourself, right? By means of setting out in your own works, in your own strength, leaning on your own understanding, trusting in your own heart, being swept up by philosophies of man and doctrines of demons to satisfy that itching ear to identify who you are yourself. You're not seeking God's will by using the Enneagram. You're seeking the will of the God of self and disguising it as God's will so that you don't have to repent for indulging in your flesh instead of crucifying it. You should seek to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not the fruit of some personality test. More on that later. First, let's take a look at the history and the roots of this thing, because although the fact that this serves as means to turn you into a totally worldly, self-indulgent narcissist that teaches you, you know, to know yourself rather than to die to yourself, which is what the gospel is, there's more to it, okay? Unfortunately, the most major issue with this Enneagram identity being that it keeps your eye single on self rather than your eye single on Jesus and is completely antithetical to everything scripture tells us about identity and purpose. You know, even though all of those things are true and it's the, that's the biggest red flag of all, that's not going to be enough for some people, unfortunately, especially if they don't know him yet. So maybe knowing this all comes from the occult will be the start of turning you off from it. I pray it will. So let's do that now. The history, roots, and origins, founders, and the occultic ties of Enneagram. So again, this is from the Enneagram website. I figure, you know, no better source of information, and then we can kind of delve from there. So I'm going to put it on the screen so that you can read along with me. This is going to block my face. Sorry, y'all, but I just thought this would be easier for you. So the Enneagram of personality types is a modern synthesis of a number of ancient wisdom traditions, but the person who originally put the system together was Oscar Icazo. Icazo was born in Bolivia and raised there in, and oh, wow, I can't read. Icazo was born in Bolivia and raised there and in Peru, but as a young man, moved to Buenos Aires, Argentina, to learn from a school of inner work he had encountered. Therefore, after he journeyed in Asia, gathering other knowledge before returning to South America to begin putting together a systemic approach to all that he had learned. After many years of developing his ideas, he created the Arica School as a vehicle for transmitting the knowledge that he had received teaching in Chile in the late 1960s and early 70s before moving to the United States where he resided until his passing in 2020. In 1970, when Akaza was still living in South America, a group of Americans, including noted psychologists and writers Claudio Naranjo and John Lilly, that name's going to be important later, went to Arica to study with Ikazo and to experience firsthand the methods for attaining self-realization, self-realization that he had developed. This group spent several weeks with Ikazo, learning the basics of his system and engaged in the practices he taught them. 
the Arika school, like any serious system of inner work, inner work <laughs> is a vast interwoven and sometimes complex body of teachings on psychology, cosmology, metaphysics, spirituality, and so forth, combined with various practices to bring about transformations of human consciousness. Now, okay, I found it interesting that across all my research, there seems to be this inconsistency with the starting point of the Enneagram as far as which one of the dudes was actually the one to create it. Some say it was adapted from Ikazo and refined by another man named um, named George Gordijev. I think I said that right. So, and that includes this primary source, by the way. Remember, I told you I wanted to get it from a primary source, the actual Enneagram Institute. However, there are other sources online that gave all of the credence of the Enneagram to Gordijev and say that it was then refined by Akazo. So there seems to be a historical discrepancy there. But the more sources I looked into, I do believe the Institute itself and there were other ones that deemed much more credible than other things that I was reading from like blogs. You know what I mean? So I am choosing to go the route with Akazo, right? Akazo seems to be the founder of it all. Now, I'm willing to be proven wrong, of course. Like I said, this is my first time really studying the subject of all the things in my New Age buffet. This was never on my plate. But my point is either way you slice it, whoever, whichever one of the dudes it was, it doesn't matter. Why? Oh, because both of them were occultists. The end. Regardless of which one started it and which one refined it, who learned from who, whatever, they were both occultists. So now, I just want to give that little disclaimer. Reading on from the Enneagram Institute, it says from there that among the highlights for many of the participants was a system of teachings based on the ancient symbol of the Enneagram. The Enneagram symbol has roots and antiquity and can be traced back at least as far as the works of Pythagoras II. The symbol was introduced to, or I'm sorry, reintroduced. See, that's what it says here. Reintroduced to the modern world by George Gordijev, the founder of a highly influential inner work school, a new age school. Gordijev taught the symbol primarily through a series of sacred dances or movements designed to give the participant a direct felt sense of the meaning of the symbol and the processes it represents. Now, I want to pause there for just a moment on kind of like a sidebar. If you remember last week when we talked about... Um, when we talked about the um, sigils of the zodiac signs, right? How sigils are actually demonic pictorial signatures. If you look at this symbol of the Enneagram, kind of looks like the same sort of thing, right? So he would teach these this symbol as a way to incorporate it metaphysically, you know, within your body through means of dance or whatever. So that's just something to take note of. Let's continue reading on. Um, so what Gordijev did, clearly did not teach was a system of types associated with the symbol. Gordijev did reveal to advanced students what he called their chief feature. The chief feature is the linchpin of a person's ego structure, the basic characteristics that defines them. Gordijev generally used colorful language to describe a person's chief feature, often using the Sufi tradition of telling the person what kind of idiot they were. That's literally what the website says. People could be round idiots, square idiots, subjective, hopeless idiots, squirming idiots, and so forth. It sounds like these people are idiots. But Gordijev never taught anything about a system of understanding character related to the Enneagram symbol. For these and other reasons, many early Enneagram enthusiasts have mistakenly attributed the system of the nine types to Gordijev or to the Sufis because of Gordijev's use of some Sufi techniques. 
This has led to the widespread and erroneous belief that the Enneagram system has been handed down from the Sufis or from other ancient, some other ancient school as an ongoing oral tradition. Now listen close here, okay? While it is true that Ikazo drew on his knowledge of a number of such traditions, the actual combination of those traditions connected with the Enneagram symbol is purely his creation. Thus, the traditional Enneagram only goes back to the 1960s when Ikazo was first teaching it, Although the philosophy behind the Enneagram contains components from mystical Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Taoism, Buddhism, and ancient Greek philosophy, particularly so Socrates, Plato, and the Neoplatonists, all traditions that stretch back into iniquity. So thank you for bearing with me through that. In order to make something thorough, we got to dig into the research. So yeah, there seems to be some discrepancy historically over which one of those two men are responsible for it. But what's consistent across all research is the roots of the Enneagram itself, meaning what its actual curation is founded upon, right? Now, just for some context, what is Sufi tradition? Because all these sources confirm that Sufi tradition, Sufi, so Sufi, I don't know, is in fact a piece of the overall Enneagram inspiration and philosophy. And then the discrepancy, of course, was what we just read, that Gurgajev, you know, got his source of the Sufi to create the Enneagram, which was not true, but it is true that Ikazo inspired some of that philosophy in the ultimate curation of it, okay? So this is from Sufism, Sufism <laughs> org. okay? So... Oops, I really need to, what am I doing? Okay, we got it, there it is. All right, thanks for bearing with me through the pains of um, just learning how to live stream and manipulate all these fun things. So Sufism is a spiritual path based on the principles expressed in the Holy Quran, great, and embodied in the character of the prophet Muhammad. And this is from the websites, so I'm not gonna say that. Sufism is a practice and way of life in which the, a deeper identity is discovered and lived. This deeper identity or essential self, capital S, is beyond the superficial personality and is in harmony with the source of life. The essential, capital S, self has abilities of awareness, action, creativity, and love that are far beyond those of the superficial personality. Eventually, it is understood that these abilities belong to a greater being, capital B, that we each individualize and embody in our own unique way while never being separate from it. So it's embodied in the Prophet Muhammad and all about the capital S, essential self. Awesome. Awesome. I'm so glad that this is being taught in churches. Yes, uh, that's definitely biblical and in no way grieves the Holy Spirit or is a direct blaspheme of Jesus Christ. Definitely not that. Pause for water. And to quickly summarize the rest of the philosophy concerning the Enneagram, um, there is mystical Judaism, right? So I'm going to go through all the ones that it just mentioned. Mystical Judaism, which can most quickly be described as the Kabbalah, which from JewFAQ.org explains is a root Hebrew word meaning to receive or to accept. So to receive or accept what exactly? Well, also from the website, magic, hidden knowledge. The website says, quote, there are certainly many traditional Jewish stories that involve the use of hidden knowledge to affect the world in ways that would be described as magic. Okay, so there, there's another puzzle piece of the origins of the Enneagram and what inspired it. Next would be mystical Christianity. And as a disclaimer, um, okay, I have a lot of issues with gotquestions.org because one, I think a lot of believers tend to use that website as their primary Bible source before the actual Bible even. And two, it's an entirely biased organization of reform cessationists, honestly, which is annoying because any Bible question there is, anything you type into Google, Google takes you directly to got questions, which I find interesting. Just like, again, as a sidebar, because Google does that with everything, right? 
with everything you type in, they always show you the information they feel most comfortable with you having accessible, not information that's necessarily true. So it's interesting that, you know, Google's like, well, you can look at the reform cessationist Christianity, nothing else. Hmm. In any case, that being said, I don't recommend or use got questions generally, um, especially that I am no longer a reform cessationist. Praise the Lord. But I do like that being said, how they explain the term mystical Christianity when it's something very simple. They say that Christian mysticism tends to elevate experiential knowledge and revel in the mysterious, focusing on mysticism for spiritual growth. Biblical Christianity focuses on knowing God through his word and communion with the Holy Spirit through prayer. Mysticism tends to be an individual subjective practice, whereas biblical Christianity is both an individual relationship with God and one that is necessarily lived out in community. So basically, Christian mysticism is having a relationship with God for means of spiritual growth rather than means of repentance reconciliation, faith, and service. So that is not to say that um, you do not grow spiritually when you have an authentic relationship with the one true living God. Absolutely. But it is to say that we do not come to God for what he can do for us, right? We come to God in reverence of who he is. So the term mystical Christianity is no different in New Age in that case, right? In a lot of ways, because really... Ultimately, the focus is all, is all about your personal enlightenment as the byproduct of your pursuit of knowing the hidden things of God through faith in your own efforts to achieve that favor. Whereas we know that a personal salvation, not enlightenment, a personal salvation is a byproduct of faith in the Lordship of Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. Now, we definitely serve a supernatural God, but we do not serve God because he is supernatural. And this idea of uh, mystical Christianity is exactly what the Enneagram serves to do. As I mentioned toward the beginning, it's an attempt to gain the hidden knowledge of God, to understand the ins and outs of his, quote, design of your personality so that you can grow spiritually, emotionally, psychologically and so forth it has you the enneagram has you pursue what you want him to show you rather than simply pursuing him exact mystical christianity enneagram same thing so next inspiration that makes up the enneagram so we covered the the sufi mystical judaism and mystical christianity next that makes up the Enneagram melting pot would be Taoism. Taoism. We already know I'm bad with the pronunciation. Taoism holds that humans and animals should live in balance with the Tao or the universe. Taoists believe in spiritual immor immortality where the spirit of the body joins the universe after death. Taoism does not have a God in the way that the Abrahamic religions do. There is no omnipotent being beyond the cosmos who created and controls the universe. In Taoism, the universe springs from the Tao, and the Tao impersonally guides things on their way. Obviously, that is the... Um, look, I, I don't know what to do about the ads. I'm sorry. I have it set up here so that they're at least one every 10 minutes. I don't know how to turn them off. I don't know how to turn. I don't know why that's happening. That's never happened before. I'll look into it for next time. I'm sorry. I hope you all bear with me. And of course, the ad is from a meditation website. The devil's a liar. <sighs> Taoism, the furthest belief structure you can get from the true biblical Christianity. And then we have the infamous religion of Buddhism. Of course, that is um, the, an integral piece of putting together this Enneagram puzzle. So Buddhism, Buddhists believe that human life is a cycle of suffering and rebirth, but that if one achieves a state of enlightenment or nirvana, as they call it, it is possible to escape this cycle forever. So the essence of the Buddhist teaching can be summed up in four short statements, which are referred to as the four noble truths. 
Though they seem short and sweet at first glance, the Four Noble Truths require great amounts of contemplation and practice in order to be fully realized, yada, yada, yada. So, um, to... Taoism? Taoism? Okay, my husband said I completely butchered the pronunciation of Taoism. Okay, sorry, y'all. Anyway, live streaming is a trip, huh? Okay, um, so I have more on Buddhism in my Truth About Yoga episode that is also on the channel. Um, maybe in the future I need to do an episode on all major world religions. If that's something you'd be interested in, put a one in the chat. But um, to that note, it should also be mentioned that there are many, 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 many gods within Buddhism, within that worldview, that are all integrated within the beliefs, structures, and practices of the religion. So... All of that, right? All of that, the the Sufi, the uh, mystical Judaism, the mystical Christianity, the Taoism, and Buddhism, all of these components, according to the Enneagram Institute and further research, all of those different philosophies, religions, and beliefs, they make up the Enneagram. All of these things that are intrinsically oppositional to real biblical Christianity, and yet the Enneagram seems to be most strikingly, strikingly popular within the Christian sphere. Go figure. Um, devil just wants to infiltrate the church. You know, the devil's not after the secular world because he already has it. The devil's after the church, for the record. What is even more disturbing to add on to the influence and inspiration of the Enneagram's origins is the means by which it actually came to fruition, okay? Which brings us back to the Oscar Icazo guy that we talked about before, as well as the other name I told y'all to remember, Claudio Naranjo, who Icazo studied with. So this thing, the Enneagram, was actually invented by automatic writing. So if you don't know what automatic writing is, it's a form of spirit contact where you allow a spirit to write through you, which I used to do when I was in New Age. I thought my grandmom was writing through me. I thought my alien family, because I thought I was a Pleiadian starseed, was writing through me to journal and, and download hidden information from the universe and etc etc yikes so when i say spirit contact through automatic writing i am not talking about the holy spirit okay this is essentially contacting a demon and allowing the demon to take over your hand and write through you so books like conversations with god which was a series that i loved in the new age by the way, because it's essentially supposed to be like a new age version of an updated Bible as if God got it wrong the first time, you know, because that's totally in alignment with his character, right? Um, books written by the infamous occultist Aleister Crowley came from automatic writing. William Butler Yeats, like the 20th century famous poet, that surprised me, but he proudly, um, proudly admits it. And yeah, the Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling. I know Christians love that one too. So automatic writing. Yep, the entire series that we have on our bookshelves and that we play at movie night at the local church. So automatic writing, is it biblical? No, it's not. The Bible clearly states that any form of divination or spirit contact is an abomination. We see that many spots, but you know, Deuteronomy 18 um a chapter of scripture we talk about frequently on heaven and healing um someone in the chat just said they thought conversations with god was a christian book i need to i saw that and holy spirit was like you need to mention something okay if you have conversations with god you need to burn that that was written by demons okay the entire context of that book is all about how there are things wrong in the Bible. Sin actually isn't real. You're kind of you're kind of one with God. You don't need to repent for anything. It's complete and utter blasphemy. It's written by demons. 
maybe I'll do another episode on automatic writing as a sublet, right? We already said maybe world religions, maybe all about automatic writing. Anyway, it's an abomination. It's an abomination. Deuteronomy 18 makes that clear, as is many other parts of the Holy Bible do. And as I continually to enforce with basically every episode that I record of Heaven and Healing, right, is that there is absolutely nothing that comes out of the occult that can be given a Christian spin and turned into something that is good. What is my hair doing? Does anybody know? Does anybody have any clue? Um, the Bible isn't wishy-washy on this, okay? There is nothing in the occult that can be given a Christian spin and turned into something good. Nothing. Not wishy-washy. This is essentially like walking into a Bible study and the leader saying, okay, today we're going to use a Ouija board so we can better understand ourselves and therefore acknowledge and honor God. Okay, if it came out of divination, mediums, or occult practices, it can never be Christian and you should run far from it. And that includes the Enneagram, okay? And for the record, because I know someone in the comments will say that, for the people that want to con contend and say, oh, well, how are those examples of people using spirit-led automatic writing any different from Holy Spirit using the authors of the Bible to transcribe scripture? Okay, well, that's a simple answer. There's only one Holy Spirit and the rest of them are unholy, okay? Holy Spirit doesn't contradict himself because he's God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the unholy spirits are the ones that were channeled in order to invent the Enneagram. So major difference. And that same Enneagram, okay, that same Enneagram that you are claiming has helped you find yourself, has helped you in your marriage, has helped you understand those around you, has helped you, helped you quote, serve God better. I promise you, y'all, that anything transpired by demons in automatic writing or in any other context has not helped you serve God better. But it's certainly possible that the Enneagram has helped you better serve yourself under the 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen deception where Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And so you think that you're better serving God when the truth is you're just listening to demons that have given you a false identity that the enemy of your soul wants you to claim and pursue rather than claim and pursue your true identity in Jesus Christ. Okay. So people, you know, may say, well, okay, I hear you all these things, but why is it accurate? Why is the Enneagram accurate? Okay. Well, because Satan's not an idiot. I mean, he's a loser, but he's, he's not an idiot. There's a reason why scripture, scripture calls us to be wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove. Okay. And then we also see the serpent in the garden. It's because the serpent in the garden of Eden is wise. He was wise. And seeing how easy it was for him to deceive the first two people ever created, right? After having thousands of years to study humanity beyond that moment, I'm pretty sure that it would be pretty easy for the enemy to lump all of mankind into nine personality types that cross-reference each other in different contexts for a variety of purposes from a stupid personality test. So why is it accurate? That's why. We could go on for this with this for a while, honestly. Uh, there's a lot here with the occult. There's a lot uh, what the, you know, the founders of the Enneagram, what they were studying, what they believed in. If you see an ad, I'm sorry. My fit timer just ran out. And look, I highly recommend that y'all do your own research on the subject if you're interested in really diving deep in knowing more. But for the sake of time, let's move on from this point, okay? Because I know this is like a lot to take in. And when I teach in this more like academic format where I'm reading from websites, I don't know if that holds everyone's attention that well is when I just kind of let Holy Spirit lead. So if you want to learn more, the information is there and you can easily access that. Um, but again, for the sake of time, let's discuss how this thing infiltrated the Christian church to begin with before getting with the message I'm really looking forward to closing with, which is all about what the Bible actually says. All right. So 
The Enneagram was introduced to the church by a man named Richard Rohr. And this is from the website for his organization that he is the founder of, okay? So this says that Franciscan Friar and you can, you can, guys, I can't pronounce that word. Franciscan Friar and you see, you see Mencil, you see, my mom's an English teacher. Father Richard Ward bears witness to the deep wisdom of Christian mysticism. There's that word again, by the way, just another term for new age um, and traditions of action and contemplation. He's the founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation. Father Richard teaches how God's grace guides us to our divine birthright as beings made of divine love, which that term, our birthright as beings made of divine love, that is like an expression. This piece of hair is really bothering me. That is an expression that I used to use when I was in New Age all the time. That's, I think that's better. Anyway. He wrote many books, including The Universal Christ, The Wisdom Pattern, Just This, and Falling Upward. So this is from one of his books also. It says, instead of saying that God came into the world through Jesus, maybe it would be better to say that Jesus came out of an already Christ-soaked world. I'm sorry, big yikes. Big yikes. And then this is from his book specifically titled, What Do We Do With the Bible? Listen to this. It says, the Christian's goal is to be transformed by the renewing of our mind into the mind of Christ. That's why I try to read the Bible the way Jesus did. As a sake of following Jesus's hermeneutic, which is a method of interpreting sacred texts. So just as we were trying to do with this year's daily meditations, he says, that's another book that he wrote. He says that Jesus was a master of winnowing the chaff from the grain and bringing out of the old storeroom new treasures as well as old from Matthew 13, 52, he quotes. He says, the Bible is an anthology of many books. It is a record of people's experience of God's self-revelation. It is an account of our very human experience of the divine intrusion into history. The book did not fall from heaven in a pretty package. It was written by people trying to listen to God. I believe that the Spirit was guiding the listening and writing process, but we must also know that humans always see, as he quotes 1 Corinthians 13, 12, through a glass darkly and all knowledge is imperfect. He says prayer and patience surrounding such human words will keep us humble and searching for the true living word, the person of Jesus, which is how the Spirit best teaches through living exemplars. So I want to read that to you because essentially what he's doing here in this little text that I just read to you is that he's cherry picking scripture. He's cherry picking parts of scripture in order to justify the inerrancy of scripture, which in and of itself is a fallacy and doesn't make sense. But I just want to give this to you as just an overview of his theology, okay? Because basically where Rohr is at is, you know, kind of just saying that with the Bible, we can kind of take what we want, just kind of take what we want, eat the meat, spit out the bones sort of thing, you know? Take what we like and leave the rest. And yeah, um, he's the one that introduced the Enneagram to the church. He thinks the Bible is, he doesn't believe the Bible to be the inerrant word of God. He speaks to it being erroneous. 
And he says that, you know, we, we, we came into a Christ-soaked world rather than God came through Christ. So, the, you know, there's the man that brought the Enneagram to the church, first through the Catholic church and then the Protestant church. Now, he and this other man, Andreas Ebert, wrote a book called The Enneagram, A Christian Perspective, barf, um, to which Vor says the goal of the two authors is to, quote, offer the Enneagram as a very ancient Christian tool for the discernment of spirits, the struggle with our capital sin, our false self, and the encounter with our true self in God. So weird. I've never heard any of those terms in scripture before. Um, now, he says all of that while his coworker acknowledges that the influence of the Enneagram comes from religions that actually predate Christianity. I don't know if I misworded that when I was explaining what I said about that guy just reading in the chat now. Um, I'm saying that it's a fallacy of him to use scripture to say that scripture is fallible, right? That, which is what he was doing. That's what I meant. Obviously, scripture is um, the inerrant word of God. I might have misspoke there. Um, so moving on, um, Rohr and then his counterpart, Ebert, they contradict one another here because... Um, one is saying that the Enneagram is an ancient Christian tool. And then the other is saying that it has nothing to do with Christianity itself, but they wrote a book on it, the Enneagram from a Christian perspective. So there's that not really the kind of consistency I want to be getting my information from. So now this is really gross. Okay. Roar says that quote, I offer the Enneagram as another of the endlessly brandished swords of the Holy Spirit. He calls the Enneagram a sword of the Holy Spirit. He says the Enneagram, like the spirit of truth itself, will always set you free, but first will make you miserable. I'm sorry, what? A couple things here. First is the notion that the Enneagram is one of the swords of the Holy Spirit. Now, there is, of course, the armor of God, and one part of that is the sword of the Spirit, but Hebrews 4.12 says that the, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, okay? So unless Roar is saying that the Enneagram equates to the word of God, then it is not and cannot be Another of the endlessly brandished swords of the Holy Spirit, as he says. Now, as if that's not concerning enough, the second concern would be Roar's belief that the Enneagram will set you free. The Bible states over and over again that the only person can set you free. The only one that can set you free is Jesus, right? The truth will set you free, and the truth is Jesus. And the Enneagram, as we have already established, is a man-made doctrine inspired by a smorgasbord of varying world religions and occult occultic philosophies brought to life by means of invention via automatic writing, aka the channeled writings of actual demons. So even though it may be accurate in some cases, right? It's only accurate because Satan and his demons have studied human behavior since the fall in the Garden of Eden. And although accurate, it is far from truth because Jesus is truth. So why do churches use it then? If it has this occultic historical context, demonic influence, was introduced by the church by a heretic. Why do churches use it? Why are there so many of y'all in my DMs, in my comment section, and in the chat tonight telling me that your pastor uses this? Telling me that members of your congregation gush on and on about it. That it's done in youth group. 
Okay, now this is from an actual ministry website, an actual ministry website. It's called InterVarsity, okay? And this says, I'm gonna put this on the screen if I can figure out how, I'm very sorry. Do you see me like struggling? There it is, okay. So this is from a ministry website. At first glance, the Enneagram might look like another personality test and personality factors significantly into it, but it goes much deeper than that. It helps us see core fears, motivations, desires, strengths, blind spots, stressors, and sins that most often trip us up. When used in Christian context, because, you know, we can just pick and choose things from the occult to use in a Christian context, um, it shows us aspects of God's character and connects us more closely to the truth that we are made in his image and meant to reflect him in the world. As you can see from the symbol, the Enneagram contains nine spaces or types, which we covered already, with each number representing a dominant personality and mindset. Each space also has a primary strength or gift that reflects an attribute of God and a primary struggle that emerges in insecurity or unhealth. Yeah, a primary strength or gift that, re that reflects attributes of God, even though it, came, it was inspired from all of these false religions, all these occult philosophies, and was created through automatic writing but it reflects the attributes of God. Don't forget. Sometimes the language of true self and false self is used for the gifts and blind spots of each type with the true self representing who we are when we are self-aware, healthy, rooted in our identity in Christ and living from a place of freedom and being fully who he created us to be. Yeah, you don't do that through an Enneagram. The false self comes out when we try to prove our worth by exploiting our gifts, using them in ways other than they are meant to be used, or taking control of people and situations instead of finding our, our security and the truth of God's unconditional love for us. I'm just cracking up because literally they're describing exactly what the Enneagram does. Taking control of people in situations instead of finding our security and the truth of God's unconditional love for us. How is using a personality test not trying to take control of people in situations instead of finding the security of God's unconditional love for us. Good grief, Charlie Brown. The Enneagram thus gives us a picture of the really valuable gifts we have to offer each other when we are living as our true self, healthy and whole, as well as makes us aware of the unhealthy places and habits we are prone to depending on when we're stressed or afraid. Yeah, like relying on personality tests, right? Okay, so tell me why churches are preaching that we need this personality test, that we need these personality identifiers of the Enneagram to give us a picture of the really valuable gifts we have to live as our true self instead of the word of God. Why? Nothing can give you a more clear vision of your blind spots than being convicted by Holy Spirit through the discipline of daily renewing your mind with the Holy Bible. So why are these churches encouraging their congregations to understand their identity from the perspective of the Enneagram instead of the perspective of the cross? Why aren't these churches teaching their congregations how to pray, how to live holy, about what it looks like to put on the armor of God? Why aren't they teaching their congregations how to cast out demons or lay hands on the sick? Why aren't they teaching their congregation what it means to renew your mind? Sounds like this dumb promotional Enneagram sponsorship within the church walls is a great way to alleviate lukewarm leadership from properly shepherding the flock. Just saying. And I say it because Jesus warns us that he will literally spit out, he will throw up the lukewarm church in Revelation 3. So why are church leaders teaching their church to press into personality tests instead of teaching them to crucify their personality and live alive unto Christ instead? 
as the body of Christ, we should strive to look like him, not strive to look like who the world or what some test and some personality test called the Enneagram determines us to be. And as far as understanding our gifts, like it said in that terrible justification of the Enneagram usage from that ministry website that I just read, we are instructed in the Bible to indeed pursue them. Gifts, spiritual and practical, to pray for gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 14, 1. And, you know, it continues in 1 Corinthians where, where Paul writes, all these, the gifts that he outlines, are the work of one and the same spirit as he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. So what's really important to highlight there is the reality that the spirit is the one who decides who gets what gifts, not us, okay? And it's not up to us to determine that, to determine what gifts we have or what gifts we could have or what or what gifts we may manifest with some counterfeit Christian dynamically, demo, demonically inspired personality test. Yes, we are told to eagerly desire the gifts of the spirit, but that context of Corinthians shows us that our desire for certain spiritual gifts originates with the Holy Spirit himself because he gave us that desire. Yet we have a responsibility to ask the Spirit to fulfill his originally implanted desire, imparting to us his willed gifts. How? That's prayer, friends. That's prayer. That's faith. That's walking in the embodiment of faith, not by sight. The Enneagram is a desperate attempt to give us sight in order to walk in faith of the things in which we can see or define our personality as, you know, are, are in fact true and thus makes us eligible in pursuing. But it's not our human nature that makes us eligible for giftings. It's Holy Spirit. The Enneagram shows you the pseudo reality of your alleged human nature and gives you the baseline in order to operate giftings in your interpersonal and spiritual life, okay? Whereas intimacy to Holy Spirit, walking in freedom of faith, living alive unto Christ, obeying his commands, walking in holiness, receiving his revelation, being in his word daily, in prayer, in praise, all of those things that actually reject narcissistic human nature and focus on him alone, that is the true place where the true godly giftings, practical or spiritual, will operate from because it will be effortless budding fruit that is produced as a result from abiding in the vine, Jesus. Which brings me seamlessly into my final and most favorite part here, which is that our identity is in Christ. That being said, I'm going to take a drink of water. Thank you for being patient through all the technical difficulty of this live stream and my hair crisis. Very sorry. The devil really, really ha um, ooh, today was rough. All right. Anyway, so now if all of what has already been discussed, um, isn't enough for you to revoke the Enneagram forever, then I'm really praying that the word of God will do that and, you know, just do what it does and will convict you during this last segment here. Because I wanted to close by breaking down some major issues with the Enneagram and combat all of the major issues, which are huge red flags, with the truth of what the Bible actually says. Okay. So the first issue here, the biggest red flag. Aside from everything I just talked about, okay, I'm talking about the intents and purposes of this thing here, separating the occult and the roots and the curation and, and the founders and the invention of automatic writing, all of the things aside, all of those things aside, okay, the issue with the Enneagram is that seeking our identity in the Enneagram is to seek our identity in means other than Jesus Christ alone. 
hey, you're not a type one, type two, type three, type four, type five through nine. Here's the truth. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you are defined by a personality type. As Christians, our identities are not found in our personalities, but in who God says that we are. So while you may believe that you can't speak boldly, for instance, because you're a certain Enneagram number, God can give you the power through his Holy Spirit to speak boldly on his behalf. So don't speak that over yourself. Believe God. Look at his disciples, right? Peter doubted Jesus and quite frankly seemed terrified of governmental powers. Yet when he became a believer, he boldly stood up in court and declared with full confidence who Jesus was despite the cost. Okay, so don't let your supposed Enneagram number define who you are or limit your calling that God has given you. A calling that he has already laid out for you in his word and spoken to you about in prayer, not given you the task to self-discover the calling via the Enneagram rabbit hole. I trust that the Lord gives you your identity and can empower you for whatever calling or whatever situation he has put in front of you and that he does that by the power of his Holy Spirit that indwells within you who has a personal and unique relationship with you, right? Not by empowering you with some worldly, arbitrary personality type so that you could have a relationship with that. John 1, 11 through 13. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Yet the world does not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay, receive that identity. Child of God not born of the flesh or of will of man, but of God. Okay, put on that identity, not an Enneagram type number. You're made in the image of God. Act like it and live like it by dying to all this garbage. Next, the Enneagram completely contradicts the very clear illustration of scripture that when we are saved by grace through faith and reconciled to the Father by our Savior, Jesus Christ, we are made dead to self. We are to crucify the flesh. We are to yield to the Spirit, to the Holy Spirit. We are literally born again, made a new creation in Him. Romans 6.6, 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, which carries on in 6.11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 5, 4, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. John 3, 3, going to do two more here. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So obviously, those are just a few of the many examples throughout Scripture that make it crystal clear that when we receive Christ in faith, it is no longer you who live. Okay, now let's just say, for argument's sake, for argument's sake, that even if the Enneagram weren't a demonic prophecy spoken over your life, even though it is that, it is that entirely, let's just say that it were grounded in innocent means, not the occult. 
let's just say, okay, that it spoke to the person you were actually born into, molded into nature versus nurture, whatever. Let's just say that the Enneagram is all innocuous and realistic, okay? Let's just say that person that the Enneagram has determined you to be died on the cross with Jesus and the new creation that he resurrected you to be is alive by faith in the Son of God, defined by the Son of God. So we can even paraphrase that Galatians 2.20 verse to read, it is no longer I who is defined by the Enneagram that live, but Christ who lives in me, right? Why are you letting a personality type determined entirely by the flesh and all its passions and desires, which are all supposed to be crucified, tell you who you are when the Lord your God has rendered that person completely dead, even if, even if your Enneagram personality type were actually who you are, God killed that person and he made you live by his spirit. Why are you going back to play in a grave with these personality tests instead of walking in the freedom of new life that Jesus died for you to have? Then you want to say things like, oh, well, the Enneagram helps me with X, Y, Z right? Oh, the Enneagram saved my marriage. The Enneagram did this for me. The Enneagram did that for me. It helps me understand my husband. That heart posture that looks like a sense of reliance on these things, a sense of dependency on these things, a sense of obsession of idolatry with these things on anything, any reliance outside of Jesus. It neglects that his grace is sufficient in our weakness. It lacks total trust in him alone. That mindset, that heart posture, oh, the Enneagram helps me understand things better. The Enneagram helps me do this better. The Enneagram helps me do that better. That heart posture is saying, actually, Lord, your finished work on the cross isn't enough. I don't actually trust that I am healed by your stripes. I don't actually believe you, Lord, when you say that I am accepted. I don't, I don't have faith that I can pick up my cross and follow you. I don't actually want the responsibility to do as your word commands in Romans and put you on, put Christ on. No, actually, I, I don't need to know you more. I just need to know myself more, Lord. I just need to develop a keener sense of self-awareness to navigate this human experience rather than believing that you mean what you say when you tell me you are my strength, you are my defense, you are my vindicator, you are my identity. I'm going to believe this Enneagram instead because it helps me walk by sight, even though you, my God, have instructed me to walk by faith. So if that's you, if you're feeling convicted right now, take it to the Lord. But I pray that you would recognize why the devil loves, the devil literally loves when we follow things like the Enneagram because it literally places our faith in means outside of Jesus Christ and actually counts him to be a liar. You don't need the Enneagram. You don't need any personality test. Why do you even want it, okay? I mean, honestly, ask yourself, why do you want it? Does it really give glory to God or does it, does it give glory to you? Does it indulge Holy Spirit or does it indulge your flesh? But can I just, no, no, die to yourself, die to yourself, church family, live for him. You know that verse, brothers and sisters, you know that verse, resist the devil and he will flee. Resist the devil and he will flee. It actually says, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. So submit to God and whatever problems instigated by the devil that you are currently facing in life, that you feel you need the Enneagram in order to guide your understanding through will actually free, flee. Because the truth is, all you ever needed was to submit to God all along. Stop making things about you. Stop making things about you. Start making it about him. You know, that's really what the Enneagram is all about though, right? 
what you've been through, how it's all shaped you, how it's defined you, how it's categorized you, how it can serve you, how it can heal you, how it can help you be a better you. What we really need to do is stop making everything all about what we've been through and make it about what he's been through, what Jesus has been through. The transgressions you are trying to work your way around through developing this keen sense awareness with the Enneagram, he was pierced for them. He picked up his cross and went willingly into death for you so that you would be shaped by the shape of the cross. He satisfied the wrath of God so that you could be defined righteous by his name for his glory, okay? He died for your sins because you could never be a better you by your own strength or understanding. In fact, without his death and resurrection, you could never be deemed good or worthy at all, no matter how hard you may try or whatever number you land on on the Enneagram. He didn't die to make you a better you. He died to make you brand new. He died to make you born again, not recreated through a personality type that the Enneagram claims over your life. So stop making it about what you've been through. Stop using these occultic tools, the Enneagram, astrology, human design, personality tests, whatever it is, I don't care. Stop using these occultic tools to try and grow yourself and instead embody what it actually means when the gospel says, die to yourself. Start making it about what he's been through. Live alive unto him. Stop clinging so hard to an identity when he came to give you one in him. See, because the goal isn't to understand what this number type of the Enneagram looks like or what this number type looks like or how I can look better as this type or that type. The goal is to look like him. So stop it with this nonsense. Stop looking horizontally and start looking vertically. Stop looking to the Enneagram or a personality test or astrology or tarot cards or whatever it is and look at the cross. And if your church is teaching this stuff, if your church is teaching the Enneagram to the congregation, take it up with them. I, I implore you to take it up with them. And if they don't change, get yourself into a church that is going to encourage you to walk in the freedom of the cross rather than having you try to navigate what that freedom could look like through an Enneagram. Jesus already shows us what freedom looks like. And he promises that it's ours. Colossians 2, 9 through 10. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. You have been given fullness. You have been brought to fullness. You either believe him or you don't. You either believe him or you don't. And tonight, your first step of walking in the faith of believing that promise could mean repenting of and renouncing the Enneagram once and for all. Okay, we're going to pray now. Stick around through the prayer. Let yourself receive it and, and be humble before the Lord. If you need to repent, then do that. Okay? And then we're going to hang out in the chat uh, for like 10 or 15 minutes after, and I will answer some questions. All right, let's pray, y'all. Father God, I just want to thank you for this opportunity tonight that you have really pressed onto my heart to share and expose the Enneagram with your people even amidst the enemy's wiles and devices and schemes and attacks, we made it happen. We kind of walked through the storm anyway, Lord. So thank you for that, Father. Now, if you need to repent for the Enneagram, maybe you've stopped practicing it and you really haven't taken it to the Lord and said you were sorry, or, or maybe you're still practicing it now 
and you know that it's time you've listened to this episode you felt the conviction of holy spirit that indwells within you and you know or maybe you want to give your life to christ tonight i just implore you to just tell him lord jesus i i know you're my lord and savior and i want to lay my life down at the foot of the cross just let my old self die let my sins die with you, Father God. I just give it all to you. I give it all to you. Make me a new creation. You are Lord. I believe in my heart that you are Lord. I'm confessing with my mouth that you are Lord. I have faith that I am saved by your grace. And I have faith that what you say about me as your adop adopted child saved by grace is true and father just put your hands up to him father that identity is enough the identity that you have given me as your child made in your image resurrected in new life as a new creation alive unto you in your fullness in your righteousness, that is enough, Lord. I lay down this Enneagram at your feet. I lay down the astrology at your feet. I lay down the personality tests at your feet. I lay down every identity I've ever spoken or received over myself that has been antithetical to what your word has called me to be. I renounce all of it. I repent for all of it. I give it all up. I give it to you, Lord, because your yoke is easy and your burden is light, Lord. And I thank you that all these things are true. Lord, I thank you that there is no identity like the identity in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you died for me so that I could be alive unto you. Father, I just pray in your heavenly name now. I pray for all these people in the chat, all these people listening in the replay or watching in the replay that have this infiltrating their churches. Lord, I pray that even now you would just fill them with the boldness that you gave Peter to preach the gospel in front of thousands, that you would give them that same confidence by your Holy Spirit to tell their church leaders that this is wrong, to send them this episode, or to go out and do their own research and compile something to show their elders. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would equip them, and I thank you that you've equipped them with the boldness to do that, Lord, and I pray that they would follow through on that conviction, and that you would use that conviction to plant seeds in the leadership of these congregations that is preaching this occultic nonsense and that i just pray lord for all your churches we come into agreement all of us in the chat all of us on the replay watching across all time whenever this is played i come into agreement with my brothers and sisters now that we all cancel the assignment of the enneagram in jesus name infiltrating our churches infiltrating the body of christ trying to speak a false demonic identity over the people of god we cancel that assignment in jesus name and we pray pray for a revival in our churches where the where the leaders would would preach on holiness where the leaders would preach on mind renewal where the leaders would preach on how to cast out demons and heal the sick and lay hands and to walk holy and to renew minds and to share the gospel and to baptize and to proclaim the good news to all nations over teaching the navigation of life through an Enneagram, Lord. We pray for that revival in your churches and we thank you that your spirit is moving. We thank you for the power and authority you have given to us by your Holy Spirit through your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name, amen. It always takes me a minute to come down from it. If you're listening on the replay, now is the time where I shut that down and we hang out in the live chat. So if you want to see what happens there, you're going to have to go watch the YouTube video that is in the description. Now, hi. It always feels so weird to just like come out of a prayer like that and then just come very casually into um, what we're doing here. There's this chat. Can do that thing with this. What? Does it still work? Huh. <laughs> 
Pleasure of being. Okay. Is this camera too? I don't like how I look on it. That's good. Okay, that one's fine. Hi, guys. All right. Um, what questions do we have? What would we like to talk about? Mike, can you bring in the dancing lobsters? You bring in the cats. What is happening with this camera? I'm trying to make the chat bigger so I can see it. This this camera like won't focus. Angela, why are you the boss applesauce? I I say bring in the dancing lobsters. Maybe like some of you were too young for that. That's from the Amanda show. Amanda Bynes needs. Uh. Okay, so, okay, I'm focused now. What questions do you guys have? What would you like to discuss? And TJ Mike says hi. Will you do a teaching on music soon? Um, so I have um, the music industry, a satanic episode. It's like one of my most popular episodes i recorded that in my old studio at home back in pennsylvania so you can go check that out but yeah I, maybe we could do something on that soon it might be time oh my do i look okay do i look weird i'm feeling very insecure about my appearance tonight the devil is a liar the god's word says i am more precious than rubies <laughs> thanks for sharing about the enneagram says samuel i can clearly see that it has an occultic background my question is all personality tests contradict the bible i just bring it back to the same question that i mentioned earlier like why do you need it why do you need a personality test why you you don't you don't need anything to define who you are or or tell you about who you are or teach you something new about yourself you need the word of God, you need to press into your prayer life. You actually need to die to yourself. You don't need to know yourself better. You need to die to yourself and understand that who you are is who Jesus says you are. You don't need a personality. I think they're just pointless. It's a waste of time. It's a distraction. You could be praying when you're reading about your, your Meyer Briggs type or whatever. This is a random question, but do you like the singer Carrie Underwood? No, I, I think, you know, I probably listened to before he cheats when I was in the fifth grade, and then that was probably it. Where are you all watching from? What um what state are you watching from? Hmm? <laughs> Please talk more about um Buddhism, where they get their sources to make a claim to say Buddha is similar to Jesus. Well, Buddha's dead in the grave, and Jesus is alive at the right hand of the Father, so they aren't similar in any way, shape, or form. Um, I, I do talk a bit about Buddhism in my episode called The Truth About Yoga. 
Would you be willing to do an episode to discuss, discuss false prophets or prophetess? So many people are doing that already. I don't need to be another voice in that echo chamber. Excuse me. Also, my, my, I really have no interest in making like call out videos. That's not my bag. I want to talk about Jesus and expose the demonic of the new age, really. So how's the baby? I love when people ask about the baby. She's great. She's awesome. She kicks so much. She's like a future Olympic gold medalist soccer player, I think. Um, Mike says she's going to be a wrestler, but that's just not true. <laughs> um, yeah, she's amazing. She's great. My belly is so like round now. It seems like it grew so much in just a week's time. Could you react to Sam and Colby one week at the Conjuring House? I don't know who that is. They think they speak to good spirits. I just did a debate that'll be out Friday, by the way, on Billy Howell's channel. It's called Premiere Unbelievable on YouTube. I did it with Ray Comfort, which was awesome. He's going to be on Heaven and Healing. And then another guy whose name I don't remember. But the guy whose name I don't remember, it was Matt something. You'll see it in, you'll see it in the interview when the recording's posted. We were all to debate Halloween. And the guy that was pro-Halloween naturally believes in communicating with the dead as a Christian. So um, I think me and Ray really succeeded in in the um in the debate of that episode as to why Christians should not participate in Halloween. Do you play any instruments? No, I am instrumentally illiter illiterate, musically illiterate. I can't sing. Um I can't play anything. I worship loudly, but I can't do it well. But I know God likes it when I sing to him, so I do. Me and Mike actually pray over Selah that she'll be a singer. I figure it's kind of fit. I don't know. I just have like a feeling she'll be able to worship um, in a way that like people want to hear her. Um, because I don't know. I just do. And if you think about Psalms, a lot of the Psalms are, 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 are hymns, right? There's Psalms to be sung. And so I think about how... That's where her name is from. So who knows? Maybe. Maybe save. It's, someone's watching from Pittsburgh. Someone said, for some reason, I thought you sing. If I could sing, I would have been lost even more in the world than I was. Because I could always write really well. And I always had big feelings and so I always used to say that like I would have been like a Taylor Swift person um and like I know I'm not objectively unattractive so I I probably could have made it if, but I can't sing so I think that was God's providence and protection but you can preach someone said thank you Someone said, I love your discernment. It's not mine. It's from Jesus. Yeah. Someone said, could you make, could you make an episode um, about false teaching of the Catholic Church, like praying to Mary or worshiping saints? Why y'all trying to have me make the Catholics mad? They're already so mad at me. They yell at me all the time. Uh, this might be a loaded question. How does the how does the devil travel through frequencies of music? I do. I, again, I have this episode. Music industry is satanic. Mike, can you find that and link it? I'm gonna have my husband link it in the chat so y'all can like save it for later because I I do talk about that in that episode. Do you think people can put a curse on Christians? No. I think Christians can agree with curses and put curses on themselves. But that has, you know, everything in the Bible is contingent on faith. Someone says, when is Mike going to share his testimony on the podcast? 
He's getting there. His testimony's still being written. I mean, all of ours are. I was actually very impatient before about him getting his testimony on the podcast, but uh, the Lord has really kind of just shown me it's really all in his timing. And he's sanctifying Mike in new ways uh, that I, I believe the Lord is preparing him to share. Um, but I think that even Mike had the discernment that there shouldn't be a premature sort of unveiling of his story because it's really like still unraveling. I mean, you have to remember he's much more, he's much newer to the faith than I am. I saw Ray Comfort, a Ray Comfort reason, a woman to Christ on the beach in California. Yeah, he's really cool. Um, he really liked me and he gave me his number and he sent me gospel tracks that will God willing be here by Halloween that I can hand out on Halloween night. And he agreed to come on heaven and healing. It will not be a live stream. It will be added to the Sela funds because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm recording some pre-recorded episodes, maybe like six or eight that I can release weekly on top of another project that heaven and healing will be coming out with. Look out for an announcement tomorrow, by the way, on Instagram. Tomorrow or Friday, um, an announcement. But anyway, collecting like six to eight episodes like this in this longer format that I can put out during what I'm calling my YouTube maternity leave just so content can keep coming out in that time. So my episode with Ray Comfort will be out in that time. Are you prophetic or have visions or dreams? Um, to an extent, I believe that the Lord is, is, is trying to activate prophecy that I've been asking for, but, uh, it, there's a lot of my lack of like stepping into it. Whereas if he tells me to talk to someone, sometimes I won't. And, and I really believe that he's kind of waiting for me to open my mouth to let the prophecy flow. That's walking by faith, right? Christians listen to Josh Groban. That's like very specific. I don't know anything. Josh Groban. <laughs> He's the guy that sings Christmas music, right? Like the whole, like that guy. Thoughts about people that claim they've died and visited heaven or saw Jesus. Why would we discount them? I think it's so messed up that people be out here saying that testimonies aren't valid because like like my friend Nayla for instance who's not in the chat tonight her first encounter with Jesus was a physical encounter and someone else very well known within the former new age to Christian community told her that was a demon she literally came to Christ and was told by this person that she saw a demon so we should not discount people's experiences like that. I don't know where we got this idea that Jesus can't be experienced, but last I checked, he's the same yesterday, today, forever. And he's alive. And the Bible is full of experiences and supernatural encounters with the God and the spirit of God and living God. So I, I don't see why not. And yeah, the stories of people that have gone to hell If that, if that's, if the fruit of a testimony like that results in someone spreading the gospel, who am I to, like, who am I to say that that's demonic or that that was illegitimate? I don't think anyone is. I understand we die to our old self, but do you, but to clarify, do you believe Christ restores glorifies each of us as unique children of God. I mean, I believe he has a unique relationship with all of us as his children, but I'm I'm personally not like caught up on like I want to I need to be unique. I'm not sure I understand the concept. 
I have developed a relationship with Christ and seek to understand his guidance on the deepest level. Will getting baptized further this connection? I've never been to a church, but I'm seeking. That's awesome. Nikki. Yes, getting baptized will further the connection. Um, however, you must understand what the baptism is. Not, it's a lot more than just like a symbol. It is or something you do and then go back to some it's So a baptism is really like that old self gets buried. I think that baptism doesn't save you, but I do think it's necessary to kind of like put the old man in the grave. Otherwise, I feel like we kind of walk around with the old man, like our old corpse on our back. Whereas when we get baptized, it goes down and come up without that corpse, right? Also, you should be prayed. Someone should pray the Holy Spirit over you after your baptism. My husband asked me, Wawa or pizza? You can only have one for the rest of your life. Wawa has pizza now. Didn't ask for What would you say to a Christian who feels there's nothing wrong with the Enneagram and that it feels that it's not against Christ? That I just wasted an hour and a half, I guess. <laughs> um, watch this episode. It, it, it is, it's literally anti-Christ because it's pro-self. Infant baptism is not biblical. I was not talking about infant baptism. And I agree it's not biblical. Infant baptism is not, it has to be a decision, a conscious decision. And again, can you show me any scripture to um, validate your belief that we're all me? I've been baptized, but seem to live in the old self a lot. Well, have you renewed your mind? Have you really turned away? Put it off. Have you put the old self off? Have you been delivered? Have you been prayed for? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Hello, Angela. What do you do for baby? I'm. We can't wait. All right, a couple more minutes. Come say hi. Here. Yes, I believe we invite demons in our lives by watching horror. Why do you want to watch a horror movie all about death when you life? Kitties. I hold them both at the same. Oh, this one's fat. Yay! <laughs> oh, Gem and Ruby, my precious Gem and Ruby. We call Gem Chunka. Chunka. Well, um, yes. Someone said the cats. We've been waiting an hour. Um, your audio keeps muting and then coming back. Is that happening for anyone else? Because I have not had that complaint so far. Oh yeah, that's good, Megan. You're right. That um symbol of each of the body of Christ being different, making up. You're right. That's good. I see what you mean now. Why is not cat mentioned in the Bible? Someone just 
I just can't not mention it. Uh... Someone else said that they've I've been getting muted this whole time. That's fine. Someone else said hearing you just fine. Yeah, someone else just said the audio was going in and out. Was it doing that during the entire episode? No, I guess y'all would have mentioned that. Chihuahuas are disgusting. Oh. My husband loves chihuahuas. Um, did Ruby unplug something? Like, someone said it was cutting in and out for me too. Awesome. Oh, having a home studio is so much fun. Oh, this, she said it started a minute ago. Um, I was going to say something, but all the audio cutouts distracted me heavily. Do you think there should be clapping and dancing during church service? Says David danced with all his might. Why, why should we not? Do you know how on fire I was for sin? Why, why are we not allowed to dance? And clap and sing and praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, literally a lot of people are saying that Micah was cutting out. Why? Always something. It's... <laughs> Um, so y'all please consider donating, uh, to the heaven and healing ministry, becoming a monthly partner financially is, um, most helpful. However, you would, you have the option to contribute one time. I linked or pinned the source to do so in the chat here. However, there are more ways to do it in the description of this episode. Heaven and Healing is entirely crowdfunded. And um, just I just really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Isaiah always says, if you got fed tonight, don't dine and dash. I think that's fun. <laughs> Someone is saying the gate. My husband. No, it's not normal or okay to be attached to sadness or to enjoy melancholy. That sounds absolutely demonic to me. Do you like Lord of the Rings movies? Never have. All right, I'm going to get off in one more moment. Like the video if you haven't already. Please share the um, replay on your Instagram. Let um, me know what your favorite part was. Got most out of this. And send this to somebody that needs it, right? Apparently happening right now. Apparently while we were streaming, a guy in Maine 
God and, bunch and killed a bunch of people. Lord, we pray that you would just be near to all those victims and victims' families tonight. They're all close to the brokenhearted, like your word says, that you would bind up their broken hearts. That no weapon formed against those people will prosper. You would just take down the enemy and just That's a really happy note to sign off with. Yeah, I did go to Domino Revival yesterday as well. As the premiere, I'm glad you mentioned that. Good news, Domino Revival will be in theaters again. Did Mike say November 13th? November 13th. So I think you can go to Fathom Events website. And I don't know if you can buy tickets now, but that's where it is listed. I go live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Central Time. The sound. All right. Yeah, some people are like, oh, this isn't in the Bible. What about the The word Bible is not in the Bible. All right. Uh, love y'all. Thanks so much for watching tonight. Again, please consider donating, becoming a monthly partner with the Heaven and Healing Ministry. It really helps. There are ways to support in the show notes. And uh comment pinned two more things here yes definitely doing a video on marijuana absolutely and then do you ever have guests on your podcast yes i really am praying to have a guest next week not sure who yet but i i need um a break from like seven hour work days like i had today preparing for episodes so likely going to have a guest on next week all right thank you so much please pray for me pray for the ministry Pray for my husband, pray for our family, our cats, and our baby. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Get into your word. If you have not already, make sure you pray to the Lord before bed tonight. And remember that his mercies are new every morning. If you don't follow me on Instagram, be sure to do so. I am going to put that in the chat and leave you with that. I have the hiccups and I have to eat. Y'all, it was fun. Let me know what else you want to see on Heaven and Healing. Send me some messages on Instagram. Leave some comments in the video once the replay's posted. Love y'all. Good night. God bless y'all.